Hi, my name is John, and welcome to another Exile TV video. In this video, we're going to talk about MPLS, uh, more specifically how MPLS works in the ISP cloud, which is something most engineers aren't exposed to <clears throat> unless you work for an ISP. So I'm hoping that by taking a look at how this works, you'll get an idea of of, of what goes on behind the scenes on your you know enterprise MPLS connections and give you a better understanding of how it works and how to troubleshoot it and uh, that should help quite a bit. First things first we have our our diagram here which I will also attach uh, this to the uh, page so if you go to exiletv.com you can download the diagram you can blow it up uh, as big as you need it to uh, to see you know all the details but basically this is your typical MPLS uh, cloud. So what we have here is a portion of an MPLS network, uh, an ISP MPLS network. And you'll see you have the backbone routers, which we refer to as P routers, uh, that don't really do any uh, work other than massively pumping uh, label switch packets. And then you have your PE routers, your provider edge routers, which do all the uh, the uh, tag uh, tag popping for the uh, you know encoding the tags and uh, depending on your if you have uh, your PHP settings your penultimate pop hopping settings hop popping settings it'll uh, affect where in this cloud the tags actually get removed before a packet exits the cloud and then you'll see <clears throat> in the bottom layer we actually have two different companies you have company A and company B they each have two offices uh, and they basically need their MPLS connection to work and and this whole MPLS cloud should be completely transparent uh, to those end users so um, this is basically the setup of a basic uh, ISP MPLS cloud you'll notice the first thing you'll notice is that um, the ISP has uh, a core of routers that are uh, connected redundantly and you'll also notice that uh, there are quite a few um, adjacencies here we have uh, we're running OSPF as our you know for simplicity's sake um, but in the typical ISP it would probably be IS to IS and what the ISP really has three concerns the first concern is that they have a way to distribute their routes they don't want to advertise through BGP so <clears throat> if you were an ISP and you're a transit provider and you may do this sometimes in a company as well um, where you have let's say a private network okay and then you are connecting your BGP routers over this private network so uh, you know for instance the entire ISP network could be private except for uh, the transit traffic but the other if you're not advertising those private networks uh, it doesn't affect the rest of the internet so for instance I could have three routers connected to three different ISPs and I have these routers connected with RFC 1918 addresses let's say I use 192.168 addresses as long as I don't advertise those uh, networks into BGP let's say I have a separate routing instance like IS to IS or OSPF as long as my BGP routers know how to talk to the route reflector and know how to talk to each other as long as they don't actually and they use the routing table in general so maybe those routes don't exist in the BGP routing table but they do exist in the in the global routing table because they're coming from IS to IS or OSPF so as long as my three routers can see each other then traffic from uh, that's transiting my network let's say from comes in router 1 from AT&T and goes out router 3 to Sprint will, will work perfectly fine and the end users or Sprint or AT&T or any of those ISPs will never know that my tr that their traffic transited a private network and this is a pretty common practice uh, believe it or not and it's one of the ways which you can reserve IPv4 addresses and extend IPv4 addresses a lot of companies also will do uh, something very similar for instance uh, you know uh, you can say say you have a couple uh, address blocks 24 uh, bit mask address blocks so 250 uh, four usable addresses in there right so let's say you have a couple of those coming into your external BGP router um, you can have uh, that, that, that address block advertised in two different BGP routers and those BGP routers can be connected with a private network 
and uh, it doesn't matter. So that's a very common practice, and uh, you know ISPs can use it as well. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean that all of the uh, addresses used have to be public. But anyways, um, for the sake of this diagram, the ISP is using uh, some form of addresses, whether they're public or private, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that they have a routing protocol to synchronize addresses they don't want to route advertise out through BGP, right? So you have um, your loopbacks of all your ISP routers are going to be synchronized using OSPF or ISTIS. In our case for this example, OSPF, so from this point forward, uh, the IGP protocol we're going to use will be OSPF. So we have an OSPF in instance, and in this OSP in OSPF instance, every router basically advertises its um, loopback address, plus it also advertises its directly connected network. So all routers will know how to get to all routers inside the ISP. Uh, and then we have um, BGP sessions. Uh, in this diagram, since we're only looking at a portion of the provider network that connects to the customer, really we're only trans we're, we're using BGP to basically translate customer routes so w customer A's router needs to be able to peer with an ISP using some protocol and their routes need to connect all the way across the MPLS cloud to their other site and both routers need to think or it needs to appear to both routers that they're connecting to each other or maybe they're connecting basically to each other. I mean, you know they're not because you can see you're peering with the ISP, but there there shouldn't be any other routes in there that don't belong to them. They shouldn't be able to get to routes that or get to networks that, that don't belong to them. They shouldn't get any extra data. So BGP has a mechanism for uh, aggregating lots of separate routes and then uh, moving them in and out of tables. So for instance, with BGP, you can use the community, the extended community IDs, and and if you, I, I we'll have to do another video that gets more in depth on BGP for those of you who don't know what a community ID is. But basically, in BGP, you can set up communities of uh, of routes, uh, and basically the tags on those communities determine who sees what what routes based on the community. So in in one BGP relationship, I could have routes for sixty different clients, and those routes will never mix and when it gets to the other side the other router will be able to based on the community ID determine which customer those routes all belong to and keep everything together so BGP is really robust for that uh, and we'll get into that so again we have the orange lines are the OSPF adja adjacencies between all of the uh, customer between the customer sites and the provider edge router and between the provider edge routers and the provider core routers or the P routers and uh, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so we can get some more detail so essentially what happens is that uh, the two PE routers have a BGP session between them and they're sharing routes uh, for customers between each other now, in order for this to work, the customers have to peer with the ISP to give them routes. Now, if you've ordered MPLS, you know there's a couple different ways you can do that. If you have a very small network, like let's say you own three different shoe stores, or you don't have a lot of IT, you might have just a cash register in each store, and you're using it to sync customer data, and you're ordering a small fractional T1 type MPLS connection, then for that instance, you probably would not... Uh, peer with the ISP using a routing protocol, you would probably just give them a list of statics and that would be fine because your network's very small, it doesn't change much. But you can see that static routes aren't particularly scalable, especially as you move forward with larger and larger networks. The other option the ISP will give you is to peer with them using uh, a routing protocol of your choice. They usually give you a choice on it. You can either use BGP, you can use OSPF, EIGRP. For the sake of this demonstration, we're going to have the customers peer with the ISP using OSPF. And and the reason why I did this was twofold. One, because it's a very common practice for medium-sized companies that don't have a lot of BGP talent on staff to do OSPF peering. And the other thing is that since the companies are using OSPF on their core and they're using OSPF to peer, and on top of that, the ISP is using OSPF internally, it gives a good demonstration uh, in the configuration for how to keep multiple OSPF uh, 
process is running and keeping all the routes separate. So it really ties into the whole VRF MPLS issue. It, it makes it easier to really see how things work.